Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how and where they invest their time, their skills, and their money, and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests. Every minute of every day, we're investing our time, our skills, our energy, and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You will hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening, and now let's get invested. Hi, Freedom Fighters. What's the story with inflation and interest rates? Where's it all heading? What does this mean to you? And what do you need to be doing about it? Today we're going to break with tradition to deliver a special episode that's going to focus on these questions that are currently likely to be plaguing you and a lot of other hard-working Aussies. Because unfortunately, as we become numb and indifferent to the rolling series of so-called news disasters, the mainstream media's latest 24-7 cry-wolf catch-cry for help to keep us scared and fearful, with our eyes and ears glued to our TV sets and the news, has resolved and revolved around scary headlines and dire predictions on inflation and interest rates and property market crashes. And, as I've said before, the only thing that's really inflated are the media's egos and their overblown headlines. So, in the absence of any other sensational disaster to report on, now that COVID, the war in the Ukraine, local natural disasters and the federal election have run their course, Inflation and interest rates have become the fear factory's latest target. So I'm going to bring some objective balance to the discussion, based on facts rather than the hysterical fiction peddled by the doomsdayers. So today we're going to look at inflation, what it means, how it's tracking, where it is now, and what we can do about it. We'll also explore the links between inflation and interest rate movements, providing context on where rates have been historically, where they're heading, And bringing this all together, how does this all impact on you and property values? And what do you need to be doing about it both now and in the future? So let's dive into it and go back to the basics of our high school economics to get a sense of where we are, why and what's likely to happen. Because the reality is that what we think and do as individuals rolls up from the local micro level to the macro global economic level and vice versa. And it all revolves around the seesawing swings of supply, demand and our sentiment perceptions that are tried to be guided and managed to some degree by variations in what I like to call the three C's, credit, cash and confidence. But more on this later. So let's start with the current media focus on inflation. In simple terms, inflation is the rate of increase in the price of goods and services over a period of time. As an example, when I was in primary school, which was a very long time ago, once a week as a special treat, we'd get 20 cents to buy lunch. And that princely sum would buy me a Kitchener cream bun for recess, a pie with sauce for lunch, and I still had enough left over to be able to get a frozen Sunny Boy ice cream and a small bag of lollies or potato chips with a couple of cents left over for my savings tin. Roll forward to today, and those same super healthy treats and please note my sarcasm, would cost me around 16 bucks. And the cheapest thing that you can now buy from the school talk shop is a piece of fruit for about a dollar. So in the space of just over 50 years, the cost of my school lunch has multiplied up by 80 times what I used to pay, which is the equivalent of a 7,900% increase over this time. That means that the average annual year-on-year inflation rate of my talk shop lunch during this period, has been around 8.4%. So this is inflation at work, where the buying power of your money is less than what it was in the past. And this increase in the overall level of prices is called inflation. And with inflation, 
our currency gradually loses its purchasing power. So its value decreases in time. So you need more of it to buy the same amount of goods and services. Therefore, the expressions inflation and the decrease in the value of money are often used synonymously. And getting back to our old high school days when most of us were either nodding off or thinking about what we're going to do after school on the weekend, the traditional economics of supply and demand, as described by CNBC, dictates that there are two main causes for inflation, which are referred to as cost-push inflation and demand-pull inflation. Cost-push inflation happens when business expenses increase and these extra costs are passed on to their customers. So with cost push I can't even say it. with cost push inflation, what happens is that the price of your imports or your raw materials goes up over time. And that could be because of anticipated events or unanticipated supply side shocks like a natural disaster, pandemic or a war. Now a good example of this is what has happened to many of the world's developed economies coming out of COVID lockdown. On the back of this, we've seen a lot of supply chain bottlenecks. We've seen a rise in shipping costs, we've seen labour shortages in many areas, and because of this combination, where most of these cost inputs go into the price of manufacturing, inevitably this has led to higher costs. On the other side of the ledger, there's also demand pull inflation, which is when the demand for goods and services outpaces supply, and this tends to happen when the economy is strong. Demand pull inflation is generally a better reflection of what happens when the economy is very close to full capacity and full employment, which is where we're at now. So in the case of a very well-functioning economy like Australia's been, people feel confident that they have more disposable income to spend and therefore demand for goods and services tends to go up. And if companies are operating at full capacity, they won't be able to increase their production to keep up with that demand. So this leads to cost increase inflationary pressures. In addition, some economists also see increasing money supply as another major cause of inflation because if central banks are buying bonds, which is the equivalent of printing more money, which the US and Australia and most developed countries have done in huge quantities during the GFC and more so following the pandemic to stimulate the economy, then eventually... This becomes inflationary when governments and the general population have the confidence to start spending it and increasing the volume and velocity of transactions, which is exactly what's been happening over the last 18 months or so. So how has inflation performed in the past and what's a desirable rate of inflation? Well, to give some historical context on how inflation has performed in Australia, Trading economics figures indicate that our inflation rate averaged about 4.86% from 1951 until this year, reaching an all-time high of 23.9% in late 1951 and a record low of minus 1.3% in the middle of 1962. And in more recent times, since the global financial crisis in 2009, inflation has been relatively flat with minor oscillations in a tight band below between a low of about 1.2% and a high of 3.5%, with the last 10 years of inflation averaging around about 2%. Now, economists and central banks over the years have come to the point of view that a little bit of inflation is a good thing. It's a bit like Goldilocks. You don't want it to be too hot or too cold. You want it somewhere in the middle. And in this fashion, a little bit of inflation is usually a sign of a well-functioning economy where it's productive and growing. So to ensure that the economy is growing sustainably and steadily without getting out of control or slipping into deflationary downturns, central banks around the world, including our Reserve Bank, aim to keep annual medium-term inflation within a 2-3% to band so that marginal economic growth is both stable and manageable. So why all of the fuss and kerfuffle over inflation in recent months? Well, according to ABS figures, the annual inflation rate in Australia surged to 5.1% in the first quarter of this year, up sharply from 3.5% in the last quarter of 2021, surprising market estimates of 4.6%, and marking the highest inflation reading since the introduction of the goods and services tax way back in the early 2000s, reflecting soaring fuel prices and surging building costs. 
Transport prices also rose the most in over 30 years since the 1990 Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, while additional flow-on upward pressures came from the cost of food and non-alcoholic beverages, which grew to 4.3% versus 1.9%, along with significant price increases in alcohol, alcohol and tobacco, housing, furnishings and recreation. On a quarterly basis, consumer prices went up 2.1%, which multiplies out to over 8% on an annual basis, which is the highest inflation rate in over two decades since the year 2000, which is mainly due to the jump in cost of new dwellings and fuel. This has meant that the Reserve Bank's trimmed mean consumer price index rose by 3.7% year on year, which is the adjusted rate of inflation when the cost of seasonal and abnormal prices are taken out. And this is the fastest pace in 12 years, exceeding the midpoint of the central bank's 2 to 3% target almost overnight. So no wonder inflation has become a major talking point. But what can the Reserve Bank or anyone else do about it to calm inflation and to get it back under control? Before I answer that, I want to paint a picture of a relevant analogy. Imagine you're the pilot of a jumbo jet on a long haul trip around the world flight and you carry the burden of responsibility for all of the passengers and crew by keeping the plane flying at a safe and steady speed and altitude in any and all extreme weather conditions to arrive and land safely at the other end. Are you feeling any pressure? And to make things even more challenging, the plane has started gathering speed and rising sharply and you're flying at night in heavy, constantly changing storm conditions that are continuously battering the plane up and down and sideways so you can't see anything but unrelenting pitch black ahead and your autopilot and complete instrument panel has failed so the only things you can do to control the plane's trajectory and to get your bearings is to look out of the side mirror to catch infrequent glimpses of occasional distant lights receding quickly behind you. And the only thing you have left to control the lurching jumbo speed, elevation and direction are the ailerons, which are the up and down adjustable panels on the tips of the wings which are the flying equivalent of a handbrake on a car. Does this sound scary to you? Is this a situation you'd be happy to take responsibility for? Now, I can hear you thinking, yeah, this is all good, but what's this got to do with the economy, inflation, interest rates and property, Bushy? Well, the answer is everything. Because this is exactly, exactly the equivalent that the Reserve Bank Governor and the Reserve Bank Board currently find themselves in as they try to precariously navigate the current and future flight path of our economy in constantly changing turbulent times that are affected by a plethora of dynamic global variables that are totally beyond their control. The only thing that they can use to manage our economic jumbo's trajectory and to keep us flying safely without spiralling out of control or crash landing, is to base their decisions on rear-view mirror pass data using only the delayed handbrake lever or ailerons of interest rates to adjust our speed, height and direction. If the RBA drops rates and lets the handbrake off too much, then our economic jumbo starts flying too fast and rises to dangerous heights, while if they increase rates and pull the handbrake on too hard and too fast, then the economic plane is likely to stall and start falling out of the sky. Does this sound easy and effective to you? How would you perform and handle this enormous pressure with such limited tools at your disposal? Using another similar crude analogy, it's the equivalent of being a blindfolded one-legged bomb detector in a minefield. One wrong step and it's all over. So let's apply this approach back to our current situation. Interest rates are suddenly and unexpectedly on the rapid rise. Why? Where's it all heading? What impact will it have on you? And what can you do about it? Let's get back to the basics so you can start to see how the entire economic jigsaw fits together in a dynamic, interdependent fashion. Let's begin with the obvious question. Why are rates suddenly and aggressively rising? Because it's fair to say that even though I was expecting rates to rise this year from the historic lowest levels ever, I was caught by surprise at how quickly and early rates started to rise. Given that I focus so closely on what the RBA Governor Dr Philip Lowe actually says, rather than the fear-mongering sensationalist scare tactics of the mainstream media. And the reason I and many others were caught by surprise 
is that the Reserve Bank was also caught by surprise by the sudden unanticipated increase in speed and altitude of the price increases in inflation that I outlined earlier. Using the analogy that the Reserve Bank Governor is the pilot of our economic juggernaut, he and the RBA board are trying to keep the Australian jumbo flying at a steady speed with slow incremental growth and altitude by keeping inflation within what's considered to be the sustainable 2-3% to range. Now remember that the RBA pilot is essentially flying blind in the dark without a current live instrument panel and is trying to forecast unseeable and uncontrollable future events while relying on looking through the rearview side mirror of limited historical data on inflation, employment, the economic growth rate of the Australian economy and global financial conditions that is all anywhere between one to six months old. And as we've all experienced in recent years, a lot can change over this time. So in simple terms, the RBA is forced to make decisions today on the second Tuesday of every month that won't really take effect for months based on information that's already out of date. So no wonder it's an inexact science that's difficult to get right consistently. Now, the Independent Reserve Bank is our appointed central bank, whose stated and legislated primary role is to use monetary policy to set interest rates in order to achieve three main objectives. Firstly, the stability of the Australian currency. Secondly, the maintenance of full employment. And thirdly, the economic prosperity and welfare of you and I and the people of Australia. Now, since the early 1990s, as I've mentioned a couple of times, these objectives have found practical expression in the target for consumer price inflation of between 2 to 3% per year. And the RBA's monetary policy aims to achieve this over the medium term so as to encourage strong and sustainable growth in the economy. And controlling inflation also preserves the value of our money and our purchasing power. So in the long run, this is the principal way in which monetary policy can help to form a sound basis for long-term growth in the economy. So how do RBA adjustments to the official base cash rate influence the economy? Well, borrowing from some great explanations offered by The Economist, in simple terms, when central banks like our Reserve Bank raise interest rates, the impact is felt far and wide. Mortgages become more expensive, house prices may fall, and unemployment can rise. And of course, the converse is true. When the RBA drops rates, where mortgages become less expensive, house prices may increase, and unemployment can fall, as we've recently experienced in the massive response to COVID. As we've seen splash far and wide across the mainstream media in recent times, when central banks like the RBA raise interest rates, it's big news. In recent weeks, we've been deluged with headlines and nightly news bulletins suggesting that rates are going to go through the roof, the cost of borrowings and repayments skyrocketing, and adding to runaway inflation that's sending sensationalist negative ripples across the entire economy, resulting in consumer confidence falling, mortgage stress spiralling, fewer jobs, lower wages, stock and property prices falling, and if they go too far too fast, tipping our economy back into the big bad R word of recession. But despite these doomsday predictions, the reality is and interest rates only rise when our economy is travelling well and growing too strongly. So in a strange sort of way, a rise in interest rates is a very good sign that collectively we're actually doing very well. But I bet you won't hear that report of the news because good news just doesn't sell advertising. So let's now drill down into why central banks lower or raise interest rates. And let's go back to the basics and spell out the bleeding obvious so that you can see how the whole economic jigsaw puzzle fits together and how it's all interlinked, intertwined, and interdependent. Now, there's no surprise that there's no single interest rate in the economy. We've got multitudes of banks setting their own commercial rates. But they're all influenced, though, by the interest rate that our central reserve bank sets. Now, our central reserve bank is like a bank for the banks. So, just like you and your savings account, banks earn interest when they leave money with a central reserve bank. And commercial banks have these things called reserves, which are a bit like their cash on hand, where commercial banks lend their excess reserves to each other at an interest rate. And they can also deposit their excess reserves at the central reserve bank. And when they do that, they can earn an interest rate. So when the central reserve bank raises interest rates, 
they're trying to control inflation, which again is how fast prices are rising for everyone, within that sustainable 2 to 3% range. Because interest rate variations are pretty much the only tool or lever that they have in their control to manage economic performance, just like that handbrake or ailerons on the jumbo jet. So when inflation is seen as rising too fast and too high for too long, like the recent inflation reading of 5.1%, that's projected to increase to anywhere between 6 to 7% in the foreseeable future, then the Reserve Bank has no option but to raise interest rates. And this change spreads through the financial system and eventually slows down the rate of inflation. Here's how. A rise in interest rates from the Central Reserve Bank means that a commercial bank will earn more on their reserves. They, they might make more from keeping their money in a central bank than lending it out. So if they do lend it out, they'll raise their interest rates to make it worth their while. And this can have a significant flow-on effect to individual consumers and the economy at large. So looking at home loan mortgages here in Australia, where there are currently over 10 million homes with around 6 million having home loans attached to them, and the majority of these are on variable interest rates, where the interest rate that they that you and I pay is linked to the central bank's interest rate. In this situation then, higher interest rates mean that essentially and immediately, the higher rates will translate into less cash to spend on other things. And less spare cash means households will spend less. And less spending means businesses will be warier of raising prices, which should lower inflation. Now currently the average variable mortgage rate in Australia following the recent rate rise is around about 3.23% according to Finder. So as an example, an extra 1% rate rise on the national average $600,000 home loan means a bit over $4,000 a year more in principal and interest rate payments, which equates to around $340 a month or about 78 bucks a week. On this basis, for every 0.1% increase in interest rates, the payments on the average home loan increased by just under $8 a week, or $34 per calendar month, which equates to just over $405 a year. And these are all post-tax dollars. So if you earn $100,000 and hence pay an average tax rate of about 25%, a 1% increase in interest rates is like taking a $5,500 pay cut. So how high are interest rates likely to increase? Well, before we dive into this, let's have a look at what interest rates have looked like historically. According to trading economics figures, the RBA's official cash rate in Australia averaged 3.88% from 1990 until 2022. Now let's compare that to the current 0.85%. And it reached an all-time high of 17.5% in January of 1990, and I remember that well, unfortunately. And it had a record low of 0.1%, which was introduced in November 2020 in response to COVID. And with the RBA's official cash rate generally being around 2% lower than the discounted variable home loan rates being offered by the major banks, this means that the average discounted variable rate over the last 30 years is about 5.88%. So against this long-term average backdrop, and assuming that the banks will continue to pass on the full RBA rate increases, the 0.75% increase in the RBA cash rate to date over the last two months to 0.85%, resulting in an average 2.85% discounted variable loan, then these rate increases are like a blip on the horizon. And while this has been the first back-to-back -back rate hike in 12 years, the RBA now rightly considers that the huge monetary support offered during the pandemic is no longer needed amid the strength of the economy and the current inflation pressures. In addition, the labour market's strong, as employment has grown and the jobless rate is at its lowest level in nearly 50 years. And the RBA has warned that further tightening is in the pipeline, with its size and timing being guided by the incoming data and the board's view of the outlook for inflation in the labour market. The RBA has reiterated that it's now committed to doing what's necessary to ensure that inflation returns to target while paying attention to the global outlook, which stays clouded by the war in the Ukraine and its effect on prices of energy and commodities. In this respect, the RPA Governor Philip Lowe has recently said that the central bank expects to take further steps in the process of normalising monetary conditions in Australia over the months ahead as inflation in Australia has increased significantly. <laughs> 
And while inflation is lower than in most other advanced economies, it's higher than earlier expected. So depending on who you're listening to, inflation is likely to peak somewhere between 6 and 7% in the foreseeable future before it starts to track back down. So how high are interest rates likely to go in order to curb inflation back to the target range? Well, how good's your crystal ball? The truth is that no one knows because there are too many dynamic variables at play and too many unknowable and uncontrollable conditions, both positive and negative, that are likely to impact on inflation in the months ahead and the Reserve Bank will be reviewing things closely on a month-by-month basis. It's worth stressing here that the RBA has repeatedly made it clear that it will only do the minimum that it has to do in order to keep inflation at bay and to return the cash rate to a more normal setting now that the artificial and abnormal COVID threat has largely passed. And Dr Lowe's actual language is important here, as he alluded to no further need for the extraordinary economic support that was introduced in 22 and 2020, suggesting that the RBA board wanted to shift the cash rate closer to neutral as soon as possible, intimating that at this stage, a 2.5% official cash rate is close to neutral. But remember that given the multitude of disparate economic variables at play, everyone, including the RBA governor, are just making calculated guesstimates based on lagging historical data. Now, as a benchmark, the average existing owner-occupier variable home loan rate in April 2022, prior to the first cash rate hike, was about 2.89% according to RBA figures. And depending on which bank economist's guesstimate you rely on, the RBA's base cash rate is likely to rise from its lowest ever level of 0.1% during COVID up to around 2% by the end of this year, and peaking around the 2.35% to 2.6% level in mid-2023, before potentially dropping the cash rate again as an anti-recessionary measure as the economy slows down and cools. But how long is a piece of string? Because we need to consider and remember that history tells us that once the inflation genie is out of the bottle, It's hard to put back and it's challenging to stabilise as the momentum starts oscillating with delayed waves of supply, demand and perception created through swings in credit, cash and confidence as the RBA attempts to use the blunt handbrake instrument of interest rates to stabilise and steady the flight of our economic jumbo by a series of over and under rate corrections. This means that in the short term, Discounted variable rates are likely to increase by a total of about 1.9% from April's pre-rise. Discounted pre-rise discounted variable average of about 2.89% up to about 4.79% by the end of the year. And increase a total of 2.25% to 2.5% from the onset of rate rises to the peak by the middle of next year when the cash rate may well start dropping again. So, on the average $600,000 owner-occupied principal and interest variable home loan, a 1.9% total rate increase by the end of the year will increase repayments by about $646 a month, or about $150 a week, with additional monthly repayments increasing between $765 and about $850, to the peak rate increase of between 2.25% and 2.5%, which is equivalent to weekly increases of between 175 and 196 bucks. So it's obvious that higher interest rates mean that mortgages are going to become more expensive. And if this is affecting all new buyers, then house prices will begin to fall as repayment affordability drops alongside the corresponding drop in borrowing capacity, where, on an average loan, a 1% increase in rates also drops borrowing capacity or the amount that you're able to borrow by roughly $100,000. And the overall softening in average property values, which will get blown out of proportion by the media to keep us fearful, will make everyone who owns a home feel poorer. And therefore, we're likely to spend less. And lower spending will translate into lower inflation. And it's not just consumers like you and I who will tighten their purse strings. Because when interest rates rise, then businesses will find it more expensive to borrow and invest, This generally means less economic activity, which might mean fewer jobs are created and wages flatline or decline, and fewer jobs and lower wages could mean less money for households, which means that consumer confidence might suffer 
which also means less spending. And if people are grappling with a decline in real wages, meaning their money buys less, when interest rates rise, they will tend to slow down spending and investment and generally depress economic activity. Overall, that will make businesses more reluctant to raise their prices and that will tend to pull back inflation. This is the credit cash and confidence connection in action. Increased interest rates mean higher credit costs, which means less cash to spend, which lowers our confidence. And of course, the converse is true. So the RBA is understandably expecting that their policy of running hard and fast early to raise rates will curb inflation quickly, given that the average Australian is now more highly leveraged and indebted than ever. So the RBA will be hoping that pulling on the interest rate break the interest rate handbrake in a short and sharp burst will calm the inflation jets. But will it? Because according to the Mortgage Professional Australia, the proportion of fixed mortgages skyrocketed beginning in June 2020, with more than a third of new mortgages locked in for two to three years at historically low rates, as reported in The Australian. Fixed rate mortgages jumped from a a historical average of around 15% of home loans to nearly half of all mortgages at the peak of the fixing boom in the 12 months from mid-2020, according to industry analysis. So it's worth mentioning here that whereas the majority of home loans were variable prior to COVID, rapid interest rate reductions and special offerings of low-rate loans by the RBA to the banks meant that many Australian home loan borrowers have taken advantage of very cheap and low-rate two- to three-year fixed loans that were substantially and unusually cheaper than variable rates. That will, in turn, insulate them from the impacts of rate rises in the short- to medium term until the fixed rates start to expire en masse in one- to two-years' time. So in the interim, the Reserve Bank's move to increase rates may not have the reduced and curb level of spending and confidence impacts that they're expecting. And the other interesting thing about our current situation is that interest rates generally only have an effect on the demand side of the supply and demand equation. But it's currently external, extraordinary supply side issues that are outside of the RBA's or anyone else's control that are the main contributors to the sharp growth of inflation. For example, the unforeseen situations that have arisen in the Ukraine and now China. Now I can hear you thinking, what do either of these remote situations have to do with inflation in Australia? Well, the answer again is everything. Russia's, or should we say Putin's, inexcusable attack on the Ukraine has led to most of the world imposing significant trade sanctions on Russia. Now, Russia contributes roughly 36% of the European Union's total gas demand and the EU has depended on Russian gas for 45% of its imports and about 40% of its consumption. The sanctions mean that this supply has been turned off. And to replace all Russian pipeline gas with liquid natural gas, or LNG, Europe needs to acquire more than 53% of the global LNG trade, according to the Columbia Climate School. Europe's energy reliance on Russia, particularly for gas, coal, oil and petroleum, has created major supply squeezes and a corresponding jump in energy costs. And as energy and fuel are the lifeblood of both manufacturing as well as transport, significant shortages have limited the production and export of goods and costs for everything have jumped up substantially. This has created a global energy crisis of unprecedented levels alongside a rapid increase in transport costs and commodity prices. Similarly in China, which has become the world's major manufacturing and supply hub, Recent zero-tolerance COVID lockdown measures have seen manufacturing and production grind to a halt alongside Chinese consumption, resulting in supply shortages in just about everything and the cost of goods increasing substantially right across the world. And on the local front, the spate of major damaging floods early in the year that have been experienced along the eastern seaboard has damaged, limited and reduced production, particularly for energy and foodstuffs. So these unexpected and unforeseen abnormal events have seriously spiked prices and sharply increased inflation. This combination of local and global abnormal events, or economic shocks, have combined to create the perfect storm for inflation, unusual occurrences that no one could have foreseen. So it'll be interesting to see what impact the RBA's move to increase rates and dampen demand – 
will have on curbing inflation when it's actually external supply side shocks that are creating most of the issues. But one thing's for sure. The media's relentless fear factor sensationalism around the Ukraine, China, inflation and interest rates will do a lot of the dampening work for the RBA as collective confidence falters and the masses start sitting tight on the sidelines and doing nothing due to doubt. But the good news is that the Ukraine war and Chinese COVID lockdowns are likely to be temporary and relatively short-lived, providing they can be resolved in the short to medium term. And average property values have already started softening in Sydney and Melbourne due to affordability constraints, where 40% of our population and the majority of the press and our decision makers reside, and growth has been slowing across the country in property prior to May's first interest rate increase. Recent trade GDP figures and wages data also point to slow levels of growth at pre-pandemic levels. So this combination of temporary and underlying factors suggests that the RBA's current move to pull on the interest rate handbrake hard and fast early, allowing for the three to six month delay in effects, will only have to be relatively short lived. And to prevent our economic jumbo jet from stalling too quickly and falling into potential recessionary conditions, the RBA is just as likely to start dropping interest rates again in about 12 to 18 months time, as the momentum of alternating speed wobbles and seesaws takes time and a series of overcorrections and undercorrections to dissipate. So what does this all mean to you, your finances and property, and what can and should you do about it? Well, let's start with the subject of rising rates. What, if anything, do you need to do as rates rise by somewhere between 1.9% up to about 2.5% over the next 12 months? Well, the answer is always, it depends. It depends on your situation and your risk appetite. Because, as I've said many times before, I'm always a believer in planning for the worst and then expecting the best. The first thing I ask you to do is to stop reading the newspaper and stop listening to the TV or online news so that you can turn off the deluge of ill-founded and overinflated negative noise. I did this 25 years ago and have never felt better. Now, if you're a current homeowner, start by finding out exactly what increased rates will do to your repayments to ensure that you can afford it. And make sure you're ahead in your repayments or have a healthy three to six month rainy day savings buffer in your offset account to cover any tight periods. If you're looking to minimise your home loan repayments, I'd suggest sticking with discounted variable rates. So either ring your current bank and ask for a rate reduction by quoting a lower rate from another lender, or make sure you talk to a savvy mortgage broker as soon as possible to ensure that you've got the lowest cost loan because our know-how finance broking team is saving borrowers anywhere between $400 to about $1,200 a month simply by refinancing and restructuring. If you're a home borrower who can't deal with uncertainty and wants certainty of repayments, then don't fix your whole home loan because fixed rates are now much higher than variable rates. But consider splitting your loan by fixing part of your loan but leave an amount variable so that your offset account still operates and you're still able to make extra repayments because most offset accounts cease to work when you fix the rate. If you are one of the few who's been able to take advantage of the recent government loan assistance schemes to secure a property with a very low deposit, tread very carefully and don't lose your job, as the softening property values may mean that you end up in a negative equity situation for a period where the value of your property is worth less than your loan. So you may want to consider taking out income protection insurance or mortgage insurance that actually protects you. If you're a renter who's looking to become a potential home buyer, start paying national rent at the level of a higher mortgage with the extra going into savings to ensure that you'll be comfortable affording the increased repayments when you buy a home. And at the same time, you're increasing your deposit. If you're a property seller, you either need to move quickly or leave it for a few years before property values climb again. But if you bought your property some years ago, you're still likely to realise considerably more equity than the price you originally paid for the property anyway. And finally, if you're a property investor, make sure you reach out to a savvy mortgage broker to ensure that your loan structure and loan costs are minimised while preserving maximum tax deductibility, maximum borrowing capacity, but with minimum risk. Because as a contrarian, 
Times of change like these create the best property opportunities. And a small window is opening up now that smart property buyers can take advantage of. Property price growth is softening, plateauing and starting to fall in some areas around the country, which is normal after the recent period of sharp growth of between 20 to 30% per annum, against the long-term national average of only 6.8% annual capital growth that's been experienced over the last 30 years. And given that property values in an area generally follow an S-curve growth cycle over 15 years or so, with 2 to 5 years of strong growth followed by a 5% 5 to 10% price correction before plateauing, it's expected that A-grade properties will hold their value, but property prices for B-grade properties in B-grade locations will be flat and declining. And it's important to remember that while the COVID catalyst of big stimulus, money printing and low rates has thrown petrol on the fire for property where the tide has floated all property ships nationally, the artificial honeymoon is now over and we're now returning to more normal conditions with every region and area's growth cycle acting independently and out of sync with each other. So a flight to quality properties and a borderless approach to identify growth areas will now be more important than ever for long-term buy-and-hold investors. And if you're serious about this, don't do it alone. Engage a data-rich buyer's agent with boots on the ground in identified locations. It'll be the best investment that you'll make. It's also important to emphasise that if you're investing for the long-term and are holding properties for 15 years or more, which I strongly suggest you do, then you don't need to worry about picking property tops and bottoms because this time horizon will mean that a good property in a tightly held area will go through a complete growth cycle over this time. But if your time horizon is 10 years or less and you need to grow your nest egg significantly, then you may have to adopt a more active investing approach through renovation, subdivision or property development strategies so that you can actually manufacture and grow equity but make sure you're fully aware of the risks and surround yourself with proven independent professionals who can guide you through this. Now let me return to the emerging small window of opportunity for smart buyers. As rates rise, borrowing capacity and purchase price power reduces and property values generally soften further. So for a short period of time, smart property buyers will be able to secure properties on better terms as rates rise before the consequent reduced borrowing capacity prevents them from doing so. So the key here is not to leave it too long, because the best time to invest in property is every time you can, while the majority will sit on the fear fence and do nothing. And with the current rental squeeze putting significant pressure on rising rents, then the cash flow affordability of holding property is actually improving. Because if the experts are right and the current spate of interest rate rises is only a short-term inflation curbing phenomena and the RBA ends up reducing rates again in the latter part of next year, on top of the growing impact of reduced housing supply from construction downturns, together with the positive upward property price and rental pressure caused by opening our borders to hundreds of thousands of migrants moving forward, then the next few months will be a great time to secure property in advance of the next growth period in some of these areas. So in summary, to curb short-term inflationary price, rise pressures, and to return to more normal and neutral interest rate settings so that our economic jumbo jet corrects back to a stable speed and altitude, interest rates are likely to rise from the lowest level in our history by between 1.9 1.9 to 2.5% over the next 12 months or so before potentially going down again without restricting our lifestyle significantly. This will further soften and flatten property price growth with many higher priced areas potentially coming back in value by anywhere between 5 to 10% as rents continue to increase. So stop listening to the mainstream media, ensure you have a rainy day reserve Renegotiate or refinance your property loans to reduce cost, risk and optimise capacity. Stick to low-cost discounted variable loans and take advantage of the current small window to secure quality properties using a long-term borderless approach on better terms now before reducing borrowing capacities to prevent you from doing so. In readiness for the next growth cycle in a couple of years' time as the floodgates of overseas migration creates further housing supply and pricing pressures and rates start reducing again.
That's more food for thought. I'm Bushy Martin from Know How Property Finance. Remember to always get invested and stay tuned for more. To get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes, just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au. That's H-E-L-L-O at khgroup.com.au. Or check us out at www.bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast. So thanks for listening. And as always, dream as if you live forever and live as if you'll die forever.